Hello, everyone. <laughs> sure. Thanks, Elon. Oh, hi. I'm Drew Baglino, SVP of Powertrain and Energy Engineering at Tesla, and I'm incredibly excited to talk about what we've been doing at Battery here at Tesla. Uh, we're not getting any more Great. Stuff, so, um, so, like, you got the quick yeah, row? I've got the yeah. <laughs> okay, let's, let's uh, yeah, just, uh, I'll take it as first, Beth. Sure. Um, so, uh, obviously, the, the, the issues we're facing are very serious, uh, you know, with uh, climate change, and um, we're experiencing these issues on a on a day-to-day -day basis. Hey, hey, okay, um, hold on. It, it's incredibly important we accelerate the advent of sustainable energy. Uh, time really matters. Uh, this sure. presentation is about accelerating the time to sustainable energy. So, uh, the past five years were the hottest on record. Um, we have what looks like a wall in for the CO2 ppm. Um, it's obviously, you know, hello, hello, all not right, like the here past. we go. Uh, it's it's really important that we take action. Um, ru running this uh, climate experiment is insane. So, especially when it's here we go. a transitory one anyway. Yes, we're going to run out of these fossil fuels. Let's just move to the future and not run this experiment any longer. Yeah. Just a little bit louder. You got it. Okay. <laughs> this is um, awesome. We're here. Battery day, no, anyway. 2020. <laughs> the so, so we're, we're th there is a lot of good news though. Um, Super excited. Uh, uh, the what a lot of people may not be aware okay that that wind and solar comprise 75 percent of new electricity capacity in the u.s this year so i can't this believe really this right now i'm major. so excited <coughs> um so the the grid is the, the grid is going sustainable uh very, very quickly um now it's also worth noting that the length of time the power plants last is <coughs> on the order of 25 years so uh, even if 100% of uh, energy generation was sustainable, it would still take 25 years to convert the grid. Um, <coughs> and, and it's also worth noting that in the past 10 years, uh, power production from coal has dropped in half. So it went from 46% of electricity in 2010 to 23% in 2020. So this is a m massive improvement. So good things are happening on a lot of levels. We just need to go faster. Um, <coughs> So in terms of Tesla's contribution, we've, we've delivered over a million electric vehicles, 26 billion um, electric miles driven, uh, and uh, many gigawatt hours of stationary batteries, uh, 17 terawatt hours of solar generated. So um, I think s solar is sometimes uh, underweighted at, at, at Tesla, but I c it is a massive part of our future. Um, the three parts of a, s a sustainable energy future are sustainable energy generation, storage and electric vehicles so we intend to play a significant role in all three uh, so to achieve to, to accelerate the, accelerate the transition to sustainable energy we must produce more uh, EVs that need to be affordable um, and a lot more energy storage uh, while building fa factories faster and with fa far less investment um, <coughs> so uh, goal number one is a terawatt hour scale battery production so Tera is the new giga, uh, and a terawatt is a, a thousand times more than a gigawatt. So uh, we used to talk in terms of gigawatts. Uh, in the future, we'll be talking in terms of uh, terawatt hours. So this is um, what's needed in order to transition the world to sustainability. Um, yeah, and you can see it's a, we're talking about 100x growth in batteries for electric vehicles to achieve this mission. Um, and we are going to get there. It's just a matter of how fast. And our intention is to accelerate it. Yeah. You basically need on the order of r you know, roughly 10 terawatt hours a year of battery production uh, to transition the, the global fleet of, of vehicles to electric. And the average vehicle lasts 15 years. So we're talking about 150 terawatt hours, give or take, to transition the whole electric, all vehicles of all types uh, uh, to electric. Yeah. So it's a, it's a lot of batteries. Basically, <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, yeah. So, and then on the grid side, uh, w we have a similar mountain to climb: 1,600 times growth from today's grid batteries to go 100% renewable on the grid, and to take all of the existing heating fossil fuel uses in homes and businesses 100% electric. Yeah, and and this this number I think uh, might grow even more. Depend, uh, you know, as the the world economy 
uh, matures and as uh, countries with high populations industrialize, uh, we could see this number be even more. But let's say it's like roughly uh, tw 20 uh, to 25 a terawatt hours per year sustained uh, for 15 to 25 years to transition the world to uh, renewable. This is a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so today's batteries can't scale fast enough. Uh, they're just too small. Um, for Giga, Giga Nevada, um, 150 gigawatt hours per year is like what we probably expect to, to make out of there. But this is really pretty small in the grand scheme of things. That's only 0.15 terawatt hours. And they cost too much. <laughs> so we would need 135 fully built out Nevada gigafactories to achieve 20 terawatt hours a year. It's not scalable enough of a solution. We need a dramatic rethink of the cell manufacturing system to, to scale as fast as we can and should. Yeah, and I think we should view this as, as more than just a question of money. Um, money is sort of like an ethereal thing, but it's really the amount of effort. You have a, a certain amount of, of effort um, you know, in terms of people and machines. And depending on, on how fi efficient that, that effort is, um, you know, f for a given amount of effort, you, you want the most amount of batteries. So it's not just a question of like, well, if we had $2 trillion, you, tomorrow you could make this. It's, it's not that easy. Um, you actually need to organize a massive number of people, build a lot of machines, build the machines that make the machines. Um, and so it's incredibly important to uh, have that effort uh, yield the most number of batteries. So, uh, and, and then goal two, obviously, we need to make uh, more affordable cars. Um, the, uh, you know, I think one of the things that troubles me the most is that we, we don't yet have a truly affordable car, um, and that, that is something that we will make in the future. Uh, but in order to do that, um, we've got to get the cost of batteries down, we've got to make, uh, and we've got to be better at manufacturing, and, and we need to do something about this curve. This cur the curve of, of the cost per kilowatt hour of, of batteries is not improving fast enough. Um, so we, we give we've given this a lot of thought over many years uh, to say, okay, how can we radically improve the, the cost per kilowatt hour curve? Um, it, it's been somewhat flattening out, actually, in, in yeah. recent years. So I mean, early growth was promising, but you can see we're kind of plateauing. So that's, that's what's motivating us to, to rethink how cells are produced and designed. Yeah, exactly. So, so um, yeah, and EV market share is growing, but EVs, yeah, aren't still inaccessible to all. Um, it's, it's and, and you can see, it's, as Drew was saying, it's like starting to flatten out a little bit because uh, the, the rate of improvement of the affordability of cars is just not fast enough. So that's why we got battery day. Yeah. To make the best cars in the world, we design vehicles and factories from the ground up. Next. Yeah. <laughs> and now we do this for batteries as well. Yeah. <laughs> it's weird, the, the slides don't show up quite right here. Is it what, what shows up on the screen is not quite what shows up there. Oh, OK. It's different. <laughs> yeah, I think it's because that's, yeah. No, that one's current, supposed to be current. Hang on. So let's get started. We have a plan to have the cost per kilowatt hour. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not a plan that rests on a single innovation, some research project that'll never see the light of day. It's a plan that has taken creative engineering and industrialization across every facet of what makes a cell into a battery pack from raw material to the finished thing. And we're going to go through that plan with you today, step by step, and build up how we get to these goals and how we accelerate this transition and make our vehicles and our, our grid batteries more affordable. Yeah, I mean, we, we basically thought through every element of the battery, well, almost every element. There are a few more elements that uh, we won't get to today, but we will get to in the future. Yes. So first, before we get too far into it, let's talk about what is in a battery cell. We've got the cap and the, and the can, negative and positive terminals of the cell. When you open that cell, you've got a tab connected to those terminals, what we call the jelly roll, which is the wound electrodes on the inside. Um, you can actually see what this looks like as you unwind it. This is over a meter long in a typical 2170 cell. So it's quite a long wi winding process. Um, and, and you can see the tab still there. Um, and then 
What, to explain what's actually going on here, we've identified we've got anode, cathode, separator, positive and negative terminal. Watch what happens as we, uh, there we go, discharge the cell. We've got lithium moving from anode to cathode. And then the reverse, when we charge the cell, anode moving from, uh, lithium moving from cathode to anode across the separator. This is the basic of what makes all lithium ion batteries, whether they're, what, no matter what the form factor is. And when we look at what, what's happened to date, at least in our products, we've moved from the 18650 form factor to the 2170 form factor through great collaboration with our partners, Panasonic, new partners like LG and CATL, and probably others in the future. Actually, so a slight note on, on why, why is the one called 18650, although not on the slide, <laughs> uh, versus the 2170, is that the, the first two digits refer to the diameter, and the second two digits refer to the length. So that, that helps explain why are these weird, what about, what's up with these weird numbers. But the, like nobody could explain to me why, why there was an extra zero. <laughs> um, so, I, so I said, like, okay, well, we're deleting the zero that nobody can explain <laughs> in, in future form factors. So that's why it's technically, it's like the 18650, bizarrely, but going forward, it's the 2170, because we just got rid of the extra zero because it's pointless. <laughs> um, and this was, this was a evolutionary step going from 1865 to 2170, bringing 50% more energy into the cell. But when we look to the ideal cell design, if we were to do it ourselves, uh, we need to go beyond just um, what we're looking at us in front of us and, and study the full, the full spectrum of options. So as you can see, we, we kind of swept the key me figures of merit, how much we can reduce the cost and how much vehicle range increases as we change the outer diameter of the cell. We found a sweet spot somewhere around 46 meters, uh, millimeters. But it's not just about a bigger form factor. Like anybody could make a bigger form factor. Any fool, any fool could make a bigger form factor. Uh, there <laughs> are we not any fool? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there are problems uh, as you make cells larger, in fact, Supercharging and thermals in general become really challenging as you make bigger cells. And this was the challenge that our team uh, set our sights on to overcome. And we did. We came up with this tabless architecture that maybe you've heard about um, that, that basically removes the thermal problem from the equation and allows us to go to the absolute lowest cost form factor um, and the simplest manufacturing process. And this is what. This is what we mean when we, when we talk about tabless. It's kind of a beautiful thing. Uh, yeah, that's what these t-shirts mean, but it's very esoteric. It's like nobody could figure it out, but. Yeah. Um, we basically took the existing foils, laser patterned them, and enabled dozens of connections into the active material through this shingled spiral you can see. With simpler manufacturing, fewer parts, 50, 50 millimeter versus 250 millimeter electrical path length, uh, which is how we get all the thermal benefits. Yeah, this is important to pr appreciate. Like basically, the the, the the distance that that electron has to travel, you know, it's it's just much less. Um, so uh, you actually have a shorter path length in a large tabless uh, large tabless cell than you have in the smaller cell with tabs. So this is a big deal. So even though the the cell is bigger, it actually has uh, more power. Uh, the power to weight ratio is actually better than the smaller cell with 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 tabs. This is. Uh, you know, again, like, this is quite, quite hard to do. It, so it's, uh, you know, nobody's done it before. Um, so, uh, and it really took a, a tremendous amount of effort uh, w within Tesla engineering to figure out how do we make a freaking tabless cell um, and have it actually work and, and then connect that to the top cap. And it's, uh, there's a whole bunch of things that we're, you know, keeping a little secret source here <laughs> that we're not telling everything. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, Sometimes <laughs> what's elegant and simple is still hard, and it, we, we, it took us a lot of trials, but we're, we're happy where we ended up. Yeah, I mean, everything's simple in, in recollection. You know, after you, like, uh, simple, everything, it's hard until it's discovered, and then it's simple. <laughs> um, so anyway, but it's, there's, a, there's a lot of really cool things going on uh, that, that enable uh, tablets, and um, uh, it's really, you know, Due to a, a really great engineering team, Drew and the, and the rest of the team have done amazing work in, in achieving this uh, tablet. Okay, so what does this all mean? Um, Creates less sounds, heat, for I, sure. I think it may sort of sound a bit silly to some people, but it, it, this was this is like if for people that really know cells, this is a massive breakthrough. For cylindricals to be able to to get rid of the tabs dramatically simplifies winding and coating. Yeah. And
has an awesome thermal and performance benefit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's, uh, thermal. So, so less heat. Matter, but it's like huge. when the cell is is going going through the the, the system, the system it, it has to keep stopping where all the tabs are. Yes. So you can't do a continu you can't do continuous motion uh, uh, production. Uh, if you have tabs, you have to keep stopping, and and then there's a rate at which you can start and stop and accelerate again, and and it really slows down the the rate of production. And then sometimes you get the tabs wrong, um, and you also get lose a little bit of, of of active area. It's 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 really a huge pain in the ass to have tabs. Range um, sixteen yeah. yeah. percent, yeah. power six percent, um, energy five. And so when we five put it all together times, and go to our new the eighty big millimeter length, forty six eighty, we call this uh, new cell pop design. can. We get five times the energy Roadrunner. with six times the power and enable 16% range increase. Wow. Just form factor alone. Holy. Uh, yeah, so we're, we're, we're just these, form factor alone. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty great. That's amazing. <laughs> Holy crap. And, and just, uh, just to, to clarify, that when, we, when we see these um, plus 16% the or whatever the, uh, the percentage range increases, these are the amounts due just to that particular innovation yeah so we'll list that's a whole just bunch of innovations, that and then when you add them up <laughs> oh you get a total, my god uh, improvement in uh, energy density and cost uh, that's just the, one these numbers are are what refer to just this thing god yeah, damn just form factor stress, alone 16 percent this is not just increase. a concept or a rendering we are starting to ramp up manufacturing of these cells at our pilot 10 gigawatt hour production facility just around the corner yeah so yeah yeah man all the like all the leaks yeah. that came out were true so far this is the amazing of uh, some of what's going on in the plant wow look at it it's already been they're already doing it holy uh, now, crap I mean, clear, it will take about a year to reach the 10 gigawatt hour capacity uh so uh this is important to appreciate like when you build <clears> a factory there's a certain capacity that you design to and then uh, it takes some period of time to actually achieve that capacity. 10 gigawatt so hour. I would say it's probably about a year before we get to the 10 gigawatt hour annualized rate uh, with the uh, with the pilot plant. And this is just a pilot plant. Uh, the, the the actual production plants will be more on the order of uh, you know maybe 200 gigawatt hours, maybe more over time. Okay. And when are those going to be made? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, one <laughs> hawk. Um, <laughs> but. But let's stack up everything we just saw at the cell level. So just the cell form factor change enables a 14% dollar per kilowatt hour reduction. Just that cell form factor change. Yeah. And now that you've been teased on this factory, we're going to go on and, and walk step by step through that factory and, and discuss a series of, of innovations there. Jeez, this is insane. When thinking about the ideal cell factory, we have insane inspirations uh, behind us in the paper and bottling industry where from humble beginnings, over a century of innovation has enabled mass scale, continuous motion, unbelievably low manufacturing costs. And when we think about the lithium ion industry, which is really only in its third decade of high volume production, it has so far to go to, to achieve similar scale and simplicity. And that, that was the inspiration <coughs> that we set out to the team as we thought about how to marry cell design and manufacturing in the best possible factory. And let's talk a little bit about what's in a cell factory. First, there's an electrode process where the active materials are coated into films, onto foils. Um, then those foil coated foils are wound in the, in the winding process we just talked about, where if you do have tabs, you have to start and stop a lot. Um, then the, the jelly roll is assembled into the can, sealed, uh, filled with electrolyte, and then sent to formation where the cell is charged for the first time and, and where the sort of the electrochemistry is set and the quality of the cell is verified. And we set out at every step of this process to try to take that inspiration we just shaw showed and, and think about how we make those processes fundamentally better and more scalable. And one of the most important processes is where it all begins, the wet process of the, uh, of the electrode coating. Oh. And wet, dry electrode. Oh scale, my God! This is what I I'm said in my video. What's in that wet process? <coughs> We've got mixing dry, where the dry the, process. The powders are mixed with either a water or a solvent. Solvents for for the cathode. Um, that mix then goes into a large coat and dry oven, 
They don't need the dry ovens the anymore. Is coated onto the foil. Oh my god! You know, huge ovens. This is amazing. Long, dried, uh, and that solvent then has to be recovered. You can see the solvent recovery system. Solvent recovery. And then system. finally, wow. the coated foil is compressed to the final density. And dry electrodes. This, Come on! Like, wow, that's a lot of equipment for one step, especially mm -hmm. when you consider that little speck next to the coating oven is a person. <coughs> yeah. This wow. is serious, <laughs> serious iron. Yeah. involved in making batteries wouldn't it be great if we could skip that solvent step which is one of those dig a ditch and then fill it kind of things where you put the solvent in and then take it out and recycle it <laughs> and just go straight to dr uh, uh, dry mix to coat and that's what the dry process really is about yes and <laughs> in the most basic form they're going to get rid of all those ovens you can see it here on a bench top literally powder in, into film, as simple as that. Jeez. I mean, it's hard, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, we so know you You fine. know, if, if this was easy, everyone would do it. So the, it's not like uh, dry coating electrode is is actually uh, easy. It's <laughs> it's 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 actually very hard to do what appears to be a simple thing. <clears throat> um, and and it's it's worth noting, like um, you know, we did acquire Maxwell as like a little over a year ago, I guess. Um, did and, Maxwell you know, do this? It's certainly a good company and everything, but the 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 dry coating they had was like, is like sort of I would call proof of concept. Uh, since the acquisition, we've we've actually uh, revved the the machine that does the dry coating four times. So we're in re revision four post acquisition of the machine, um, and there's still a lot of work to do. So I would not say this is like completely in the bag. There's still a lot of work to do. Oh. Um, and you know, as you go as you scale, go from like bench top to lab to uh, pilot to volume production, uh, there are actually major issues that you encounter at at every level. It's not like you know, you, you make something work on your on your bench, and bingo! Now you can make a bazillion of, uh, of no, it. Yeah, Absolutely, it it's insanely like that. difficult to scale up. Damn! Um, so they don't have yeah, it in the bag. But, yeah. but if you do scale it up, yeah, what what you saw before becomes this. Yeah, so you can see the motivation: a ten times reduction in footprint, a ten times reduction in energy, and a massive reduction in investment. Um, but as Elon was saying, simple is hard. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean to be clear, I would like to not say that we, right now it's just totally working. It's 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 close to working, <laughs> but it's not <laughs> even now it, at the pilot plant level. It is close to working. Well, I see, okay, I it's fair to say it probably it does work, but with not a good, with not a high yield. Yeah. So we're, we're still ironing out the kinks, but we've made tens of thousands yeah. of cells, thousands of kilometers sure. of electrode. I mean, we are on the fourth generation of the equipment, so we've learned a lot along the along the way. Yeah. I mean, it is super demanding because every atom has its place if you want to deliver the energy density and the cycle life and the supercharging. Yeah. But we're, but we're, we're confident that we will get there, but yeah. it will be a lot of work along the way. There's a clear path to success, but a ton of work between here and there. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, but this is a, a really profound improvement. Again, for people that know battery uh, manufacturing, this is, a, this is gigantic. Um, We'll probably be on on machine revision six or seven by the time we do large scale production. Um, the, the rate at which the machines are being improved is is extremely rapid. Like literally every three or four months is a new rev. Okay, so yeah, three or four months. Yeah, and beyond the so electrode, we we continue to innovate on every other process step. So let's talk a little bit about nine uh, to twelve assembly, months, which is next until they start ramping up full production of these the cells. The key to a high performing assembly line <coughs> is. Accomplishing processes while in motion, continuous motion, uh, and uh, thinking of the line as a highway, max velocity down the highway, no start yeah. and stop, no city driving. Exactly, no st stop lights and traffic lights or anything. You want uh, continuous the motion. Not the highway. Yeah. And together with our internal design team that makes this equipment and designs this equipment, we coupled thinking about how to make the best cell with thinking about how to make the best equipment so that we could accomplish the fastest parts per minute rates on all of these tools. Um, and through all of that development, we were able to get to the point where we can uh, implement assembly lines, one line, 20 gigawatt hours, seven times increase in output per Ooh. line. And when you're thinking about scalability mm -hmm. and pure effort, having one line be seven X the capability is just effort multiplying. Yeah. So. Seven times, okay, okay. Yeah, you can sort of think about like the, the sort of the fundamental physics of a factory or something. Like, um, I think it's actually quite a lot like the rocket equation, uh, where 
uh, you've got basically in the rock equation, you've got your exhaust velocity and then the uh, log of the start to uh, end masses. So it's basically saying, you know, how fast are things going and what percentage of your the factory volume is doing useful work. And conveyance does not count as useful work. <laughs> so um, only the value added steps. Yeah, if you if you break the factory down into uh, cu cubic meter sections um, and say, uh, or, or smaller, it could be like one you know one liter sections, and say, uh, is a majority of, of this volume doing useful work? You would be astounded at how bad most factories are. They're like hmm. maybe two or three percent, including our factory in Fremont. Um, so I, I think it, it's possible to get to at least uh, ten times that uh, uh, volumetric efficiency. Uh, so more like you know thirty percent uh, ish, maybe more. Um, and be 10x better, it, it, which means the factory can be 10 times smaller. Um, and then the other thing is how fast are things going through, through the factory? It's like speed and density. Um, the, the, fa the faster you go, like if a factory that's moving at say twice the speed of another factory is equivalent to two, two factories, basically. And the, the company that will be successful uh, is the co company that with one factory can accomplish what other companies take two or three or four factories to do. So. This is what we're trying to do here is, is say, okay, how do we, uh, with, with, a f with one factory, achieve what maybe five or even ten factories would normally be required oh. to achieve? Wow. And, and the vertical integration with the machine design teams at, you know, Groman and, 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 and Highbar and others allows us to really accomplish that because we don't have all these edge conditions between one piece of equipment and another. We can design the entire machine to be one machine and remove all of these unnecessary steps. Yeah, uh, I mean, t basically Tesla uh, is, is aiming to be the, the best at manufacturing of any company on earth. Uh, this is the thing that's <laughs> actually most important in the long run. I think, um, you know, just from a company standpoint and, and from basically um, achieving sustainability as fast as possible, uh, but I think also for long-term competitiveness, um, eventually every, every car company will have long-range electric cars. Um, I, you know, eventually every company will have autonomy I think, but not every company will be uh, great at, at manufacturing. Uh, Tesla will be absolutely head and shoulders above anyone else in manufacturing. That is our goal. <laughs> I like the other guy just laughs. <laughs> manufacturing yeah. is hard and hard problems are fun to yeah. solve. Um, okay, now solve. let's talk about formation. In a, in a typical cell factory, formation represents 25% of the investment. And what is formation? It's, it's charging and discharging cells and verifying the quality of the cell. Turns out we've charged and discharged billions and <coughs> billions of cells in our vehicles, so we know a thing or two about that. The typical formation setup is you it's charge and automated. discharge each Look cell individually. That. In our car, we charge thousands of cells at once. And we took our principal and our power electronics, leveraging p power wall, vehicle battery management systems, and others to dramatically improve the, the formation equipment uh, cost effectiveness and density. 86% reduction in formation investment, 75% reduction in footprint. So. You want to take this one? Uh, sure. So <laughs> essentially what this translates to, based on what we know today, is about a 75% reduction uh, in the investment per kilowatt hour uh, or gigawatt hour. It's it's just uh, basically four times better than the current state of the art, to the best of our knowledge, uh, and uh, I think there's probably room to improve even beyond that. Definitely, uh, definitely, yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, we're able to, from a volume standpoint, actually get what um, in, in a smaller form factor than Giga Nevada, uh, we were able to get uh, many times the 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 uh, Cell output, so uh, you can see, like basically, we can get a terawatt hour in le in less space than it took to make a gigawatt hour, uh, uh, you know, it, uh, 150 gigawatt hours. So this is pretty profound. You know, it's like I would actually not have thought this was possible uh, several years ago um, that we could actually get to terawatt hour scale in less in less space than uh, what we we currently envision for doing 150 gigawatt hours. So yes, simpler accelerates terawatt hour scale, and that's what we need to do to accelerate our mission. Um, and, you know, as Elon said, we're going to try to even improve on this as we uh, Jeez, push towards our goal. This is insane. Which are? <coughs> yeah, so uh, <laughs> uh, f f f this, this is just for... <laughs> Ten uh, and seven years. This is Three just talking terawatt about hours. Tesla internal cell production. The plan. Um, as I tweeted out earlier, we will continue to uh, use our cell suppliers, uh, Panasonic and 
uh, LG and CATL. Um, and so this is 100 gigawatt hours supplemental to uh, what we buy from suppliers. Um, and uh, yeah, essentially, th this, this does like reduce our weighted average cost of a cell because uh, if it, but it does it allows us to make a lot more cars and a lot more stationary storage. Um, and, um, and then long term, we're uh, expecting to make on the order of uh, 3,000 gigawatt hours or, or 3 terawatt hours per year. Um, I, think we can, you know, I think we've got a good chance of, of achieving this actually before 2030, but I, I'm highly confident that we could do it by, by 2030. When you look at the size of that factory on the previous page, it really shows how enabling all of these advancements are in achieving a three terawatt hour goal by 2030. And not only is there all of go. that manufacturing innovation <coughs> fantastic for enabling <coughs> scale, it's also an additional 18% reduction in dollar per kilowatt hour at the battery pack level. But wait, there's more. Dollar oh, per wait. kilowatt yeah. hour, 18% <laughs> less. Yeah. <laughs> but wait, there's so more. So we have a manufacturing system, we've got a cell design, what are the active materials we're going to put in that cell design? Let's talk about the anode first. Let's talk about silicon. Why is silicon awesome? It's awesome because it's the most abundant element in the Earth's crust after oxygen, which means it's everywhere. It's sand. Yeah. <laughs> um, sand is silicon dioxide. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it happens to store nine times more lithium than graphite, which is the typical anode material in, in lithium-ion batteries today. So why isn't everybody using it? The re main reason is because the challenge with silicon is that it expands 4x when fully charged with lithium. Oh, shoot. And basically all, all of that expansion, expansion stress bad. on the particle, the particles start cracking, they start electrically isolating, you lose capacity, the energy retention of the battery starts to fade, and it, it also gums up with a passivation layer that has to keep reforming as the particles expand. Yeah, so basically how do you solve with, this? with silicon, the cookie crumbles and gets gooey. <laughs> That's basically what happens. Good analogy. Yeah. Um, and current approaches to solve this, which exist, I mean, we have silicon in, in the cars that you're all in right now, are involved highly engineered, expensive materials uh, in, in the scheme of things. Now, they're still great, and they enable some of the benefits of silicon. They just don't enable all of it, and they're not scalable enough. And you can see some of the things that, that maybe you've heard of, SIO, silicon with, with carbon, or silicon nanowires. I mean, that's kind of the space right now. What we're proposing is a <coughs> step change in Tesla capability silicon? and a and a step change in cost. And what that really is is to just go to the raw metallurgical silicon itself. Don't engineer the base metal. Just start with that and design for it to expand in how you think of the the particle in the electro design and and how you you code it. Yeah, I'm not sure if you saw this. Basically, a dollar uh, is per kilowatt hours. Yeah, um, a dollar per kilowatt if you, hour. If you use Simple silicon, <laughs> it's dramatically less than even the silicon that is currently used in the batteries that are made today. Um, and you can use a lot more of it. The anode would cost, yeah, with this silicon, and the anode costs a dollar and 20 cents a kilowatt hour. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> that's impossible. Yeah. <laughs> Not impossible, that's amazing. Um, and how does it work? Start with raw <coughs> metallurgical silicon, stabilize the surface with an elastic ion conducting polymer coating that is uh, applied through a very scalable approach. Um, no, no, no like chemical vapor deposition, no highly engineered high, high capex solutions. And then integrated in the electrode through a robust network formed out of a highly elastic binder. Um, and in the end, by leveraging this silicon to its potential, we Have can increase done the range this of our vehicles by an additional 20% just this uh, improvement. Yeah, it gets cheaper and longer range. 20% longer range, okay. Is this theoretical or are they doing this right now? Come on. Yeah, and, and when we take that anode cost reduction, we're looking at another 5% dollar per kilo, kilowatt hour reduction at the battery pack level. And there's more. <laughs> <laughs> and there's more. Let's talk about cathodes. What is a battery cathode? Cathodes are like bookshelves. Like science class. Where the metal, you know, the nickel, the cobalt, the manganese, or aluminum is like the shelf, and the lithium is the book. And really... What sets apart these different metals is how many books of lithium they can fit on the shelves and how sturdy the shelves are. Cobalt uh, is a pr pr yeah, Sorry, I, I was just gonna say, like, it, it's, it's tough to exactly figure out what the right analogy is to explain uh, cathode and, and anode, but a bookshelf is probably a pretty good one um, in the sense that um, y you, need, you need a stable structure uh, to contain the ions. Um, so you want a structure that does not uh, crumble or get gooey or basically that that holds its shape 
uh, both the cathode and the anode, um, as you're moving these ions, ions back and forth, uh, you, 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 it needs to retain its structure. Uh, so uh, if it doesn't retain its structure, then you lose cycle life and your battery capacity drops very quickly. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I totally agree. And, and I think people are always talking about like, oh, what's the cathode going to be? Is it NCA or whatever, you know? The thing to consider is just fundamentally what the nickel, the, the, the metals are capable of, and that's what we have on the chart here. Dollar per kilowatt hour cathode of just the metal, using just LME, you know, London Metal Exchange prices, um, versus the energy density of just the cathode. And you can see nickel is the cheapest and the highest energy density, and that's why increasing nickel is a goal of ours and really everybody's in the energy and in the uh, battery industry. Um, but one of the reasons why cobalt is even used at all is because it is a very stable bookshelf. And the challenge with going to pure nickel is stabilizing that bookshelf with only nickel. And that's what we've been working on with our high nickel co cathode development, which has zero cobalt in it, leveraging novel coatings and dop novel coatings and dopants. Uh, we can get a 15% reduction in cathode dollar per kilowatt hour. Yeah. No cobalt. Big deal. Remove cobalt. But it's not just about nickel. You want to? Yeah, sure. Um, so <laughs> you want to take it? In order to scale, uh, we really need to make sure that we're not constrained by total nickel availability. Um, I actually spoke with the uh, the CEOs of the biggest mining companies in the world and said, w uh, "Please make more nickel. Mm. It's very important." Um, and so th I think they are going to make more nickel. Please make more uh, nickel. <laughs> when, uh, it, I, there's also uh, mine more nickel. You know, uh, I think we need to have a, a, a kind of a three-tiered approach to to batteries. Um, so starting with iron, that's kind of like a medium range, and then nickel manganese as sort of a medium plus uh, uh, intermediate, um, and then a high nickel for long range applications like Cybertruck and uh, the semi. Um, something like a, like a semi truck, it's extremely important to have a uh, high energy density uh, in order to get long range. So, um, and, and uh, just to give Not sort of like iron a bit um, more time, like the, uh, although the, you know, if you look at the, uh, white ounce per kilogram uh, at the cathode level of, um, of iron, uh, it looks like nickel's twice as good. Uh, but when you've w fully considered at the pack level everything else taken into account, uh, nickel is about maybe 50 or 60 percent better than, uh, uh, than iron. So I iron is not a is little better than it would seem when you, t when you look at it at the, uh, the pack level fully considered. Um, it's, still, it's not as good as nickel. Nickel is like 50 to 60 percent better, uh, but it's, still pr it's actually pretty good. Um, and so, you know, uh, g good for stationary storage and for uh, medium range applications uh, where energy density is not paramount. And then, like I said, for intermediate, uh, it's kind of a nickel manganese. Um, and it, it's uh, relatively straightforward to do a cathode that's uh, two thirds nickel, one third manganese, uh, which would then allow uh, us to make 50% more uh, cell volume uh, with the same amount of nickel. And with very little energy trade off. I mean, yeah. Uh, just enough to, to, to have you still want to use 100% nickel for something like a, a semi truck, but but really not much of a sacrifice at all. Yeah. Um, and you know, beyond the metals, because a lot of people spend time talking about the metals. Actually, the cathode process itself is a big target. 35% of the cathode dollar per kilowatt hour is just in mo transferring it into its final form, and so we see that as a big target, and we we decided to take that on. Um. Here's a view of the traditional cathode process. Effectively, uh -huh. if you start at the left and you have the metal from the, the mine, the first thing that happens is the metal from the mine is changed into an intermediate thing called a metal sulfate, because that's just happened to be what chemists wanted a long time ago. And then, you, and then when you're making the cathode, you have to take this intermediate thing called a metal sulfate, add chemicals, add a whole bunch of water, a whole bunch of stuff happens in the middle, <laughs> and at the end, you get that little bit of cathode and a whole bunch of wastewater and byproducts. <coughs> yeah, it's, it's insanely complicated. Uh, hmm. If you if you look at the total, like if you're just like, you know, it's a small world journey of uh, I am a nickel atom. What happens to me? And it's like it's crazy. Like you're going around the world three times. It's there's like the moral equivalent of like digging the ditch, filling the ditch, and digging the ditch again. <laughs> uh, it's total madness, basically. <laughs> um, and these things just grew up as just a, they're just kind of like legacy things that. Uh, it's like how it was done before, and then they Gotta connected change the dots, that. Uh, but really didn't think of the whole thing from like a first principle standpoint, saying how do we get from 
the nickel ore in the ground to the finished nickel product in a port battery. Uh, and so we've, we've looked at the entire value chain and said, wow. how can we make this as simple as possible? <laughs> That's and that's what amazing. we're proposing here with our process. As you less can see, a whole, less, a whole lot less is going on here. Metal, water, less We get rid of the intermediate. Cathode. Metal, water, final pro product cathode. Recirculate the water, no waste water at all. Jeez. And when you summari summarize all of that, it's a 66% reduction in CapEx investment, a 76 reduction in process cost, and zero waste water. What Much other company does this? Yeah. No other company does this. It's like, let's look at how it was done and just... And then when you Freaking think about the fact it. that now we're actually just directly consuming the raw metal nickel powder, it dramatically simplifies the metal refining part of the whole process. So we can eliminate billions in battery grade nickel intermediate production. It's not needed at all. Yeah. Um, and uh, we can also use that same process we showed on the previous page to directly consume the metal powder coming out of recycled electric vehicle and grid storage batteries. So. This process enables both simpler mining and simpler recycling. Wow, man. Um, and now that we have this process, obviously we're going to go and start building our own cathode facility in North <laughs> America and leveraging all of the North American resources that exist for nickel and lithium. And just doing that, just localizing our cathode supply chain and production, we can reduce <sighs> miles traveled by all the materials that end up in the cathode by 80%, which is huge for cost. Yeah, I mean, c c to be clear, cathode production would be part of our the, te the Tesla cell production plant. So it would just be, you know, basically, you know, uh, raw materials coming from the mine, and uh, from raw materials in the mine, out comes a battery. And on that note, the way the lithium ends up in the cell is through the cathode, so then we should obviously on-site lithium conversion as well, which is what we will do using a new process that we're going to pioneer. That's a sulfate-free process again, skip the intermediate. 33% um, reduction in lithium cost, 100% electric facility co-located with the cathode plant. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it's important to note that there is a massive amount of lithium on Earth. Um, yeah. So uh, lithium uh, is not like oil. There's a, a massive amount of it pretty much everywhere. <laughs> um, so uh, in fact, there's, there's enough um, lithium in the United States to convert the entire United States fleet to electric. It's like the, all the cars in the United States, all, there's like 300 million or something like that. Uh, e every vehicle in the United States can be converted to electric using only lithium that is available in the United States. Discovered today. Well, that, yeah, what we already know is exists. People really there's, haven't even been looking. Yeah, people haven't even <laughs> been trying because it's just like widely available. So, yeah. um, uh, but it, it is important to say like, okay, what is the smartest way to uh, take the ore and uh, extract the lithium and and do so in an environmentally friendly way, um, and w we actually discovered a again looking at a sort of first principles physics standpoint, um, in, instead of just the way it's always been done, um, is w we found that uh, we can actually use table salt, uh, sodium chloride, uh, to uh, basically ex extract the lithium from the ore, um, and uh, th this is nobody's done this before, uh, to the best of our knowledge, nobody's done this, um, and it's a, a, a sort of you know, all the elements are reusable. It's a, a very sustainable way of, of obtaining lithium, um, and we actually uh, uh, we, we we actually got uh, rights to a, a lithium clay deposit in Nevada, over um, ten thousand acres. Over ten thousand acres, um, and then the the nature of the mining is actually I think also very environmentally uh, sensitive in that we, we we sort of take a chunk of dirt out of the ground, or remove the lithium, and then put the chunk of dirt back where it was. So. <laughs> It will look pretty much the same as before. <laughs> uh, it, it will not look like terrible, and yeah, it will be nice, <laughs> nice, <Yeah. laughs> nice mining. Yeah. So simply mix clay with salt, put it in water. Salt <coughs> comes out with the lithium. Done. I yeah, mean, it's, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we're really excited about this, and and there really is enough lithium in Nevada alone to electrify the entire U.S. fleet. Yeah, I think that's true. Actually, just what's in Nevada? That's uh, that's uh, basically so much damn lithium on Earth. It's crazy. <laughs> Um, it's one of the most common elements on the planet. Um, and eventually, awesome. as we said at the beginning, when we get to this steady state 20 terawatt hours per year of production, we will tr transfer the entire non-renewable fleet of both power plants, home heating and, 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 batter and, and industry heating, and, v and vehicles to electric. And at that point, we have an awesome resource in those batteries to recycle to make new batteries. So we don't need to do any more mining at that point, and you can see why. 
<laughs> the, the, the difference in the, the value of the, of the material coming back from the vehicle versus the ground, you'd always go to the vehicle. And we recycle 100% of our vehicle batteries today. And actually, we are starting our pilot full-scale recycling production uh, at Gigafactory Reno next quarter. So to continue to develop this process as, as our recycling returns grow. Yeah, I mean, to date it's been done by third parties, but uh, we think we can, we can recycle the, the batteries more effectively, especially since, uh, you know, we, we kn our batteries, we're making the same battery as the thing we're recycling. So uh, whereas, like, third party recyclers have to consider batteries of all kinds. Yeah, and, and, and just to think about what this actually means, the recycling resource is always 10 or greater years delayed because batteries last a really long time. But eventually, it is the way that, that all resources will be ma made available, and that's why we're investing in this recycling facility at, in Nevada. Yeah. Cool. L long term, new batteries will come from old batteries uh, once the fleet reaches steady state. Right. OK, so we just talked about scaling cathode and recycling. All of the benefits that you just Cell saw are vehicle added to integration. this benefit of a 12% reduction in dollars per kilowatt hour at the battery pack level. Almost at our have the cost goal, but there's one more section. Take it away, Elon. Oh, so um, I mean th there's an architecture that um, we've been wanting to do with Tesla for a long time, uh, and we're finally we finally figured it out. Um, <laughs> and I think it's it's the way that all electric cars in the future will ultimately be made. Uh, it's the right way to, right way to do things. Cell vehicle um, integration. So it's, it's, it starts with uh, having a single piece casting or a single oh, piece casting yeah, for the, the front body and the rear body. Giga um, cast. And, uh, in order to do this, we uh, commissioned the, the largest casting machine that has ever been made. Oh and it's currently God. working just uh, over the road at our uh, fr Fremont plant. Giga cast, uh, man. <laughs> we have the, the, yeah. the, it's pretty sweet. Yeah. Um, ma making the, uh, entire currently making the entire uh, rear section of the car in a, as a single piece, high pressure die cast aluminum. Um, and in order to do this, we actually uh, had to develop our own alloy uh, because we wanted a high strength the casting alloy, alloy that alloy. Not, did not require coatings or heat treatment. Uh, this is a big deal for, for castings, especially with a, la a large casting. If you heat treat it afterwards, it, it tends to deform. It kind of like does this like potato chip thing. So it's very hard to keep a large casting uh, to have its shape. Um, so in order to achieve this, th there was no alloy that existed that could do this. So we developed our New own alloy, alloy, a special alloy of aluminum that has high strength without heat treat and, and is very castable. Uh, so that's a you know a, a great achievement of our materials team. Um, in fact, in general, we've got a lot of advanced materials <laughs> coming for, for Tesla that uh, new alloys and, and materials that have never existed before. Yeah, that's what so, Sandy said. Uh, Sandy Monroe. So you're basically making this the, the, the front and rear of the car as a single piece. Um, and then that that, that then inter the interfaces to uh, what we call it the structural battery, where the battery for the first time battery. will have dual use. Uh, the battery will both have the use as an energy device and as structure. This this is absolutely the way things are done. In in the early days of of aircraft, they would carry the fuel tanks as cargo. So the the fuel tanks um, actually had. W were quite difficult Batteries are going to be They're in like basically the worse than okay. cargo. You had to, had to kind of bolt them down. Um, it was very difficult. Uh, and then somebody said, hey, what if we just make the wing tanks, uh, wh what if we just make the fuel tank in wing shape? So uh, all modern airplanes, the fuel tank, your, your wing is just a, a, a fuel tank in wing shape. This is absolutely the way to do it. Um, and then the, the, the fuel tanks. Oh serves my as God, this is nuts. Um, and it's the not batteries are going to be integrated it, into it's the it's chassis? It's fundamental to the structure of the aircraft. This was a major breakthrough. Um, we're doing the same for cars. So, <laughs> what? So, so this is really quite profound. Uh, the, effectively, the, the non-cell portion of the battery has negative mass. So it, we, we save so much mass in the rest of the vehicle. We, we save more mass in the rest of the vehicle than the non-cell portion of the battery. So it's like, well, how do you really minimize the mass of a battery? Make it negative. Make the battery non-cell portion of the battery pack negative. Um, so um, it, it also allows us to pack the cells more densely because we do not have uh, intermediate structure in the battery pack. 
So instead of having Future these like, automotive uh, battery. supports and stabilizers and stringers <coughs> and structural elements in the battery, we now have a lot more space in the battery because the pack itself is structural. Um, the, uh, and what we do is essentially, um, like what we, like we, instead of having just um, a filler that is a flame retardant, which is currently what is, is in the 3NY battery packs, we have a filler that is a, a, a structural adhesive um, as well as flame retardant. So it effectively glues the cells to the top and bottom sheet. And this allows you to do shear transfer between the upper and lower sheet. Just like uh, if you have like a Formula One uh, craft or like a, a racing boat and you have uh, carbon fiber face sheets and say aluminum honeycomb between them, uh, this uh, gives you incredible stiffness. Um, and it's really the way that, that any super fast thing works is uh, you, you, you create a, um, basically a, a, a honeycomb sandwich with, with two uh, face sheets. Uh, this is actually even better than what aircraft do, because aircraft do not do this. Um, they, they can't do this because fuel is liquid. So <laughs> in our case, the batteries are solid. So we can actually use the, sh the, the steel shell case of the battery to transfer uh, sh uh, shear from the upper and lower face sheet, which makes for an incredibly stiff structure, even stiffer than a regular car. Yeah. In, in fact, if this was, if, if this was an, in a, uh, in a uh, like a, a convertible uh, that had no upper structure, it would be stiffer than, that convertible would be stiffer than a regular car. So this is, a, it's just really, to ha, ha, it's a pro, really major. Um, so it improves the mass efficiency of the battery. Um, and then the, those castings are also quite important because you want to transfer load into the structural battery pack uh, in a very smooth, continuous way. Um, so you don't um, put uh, arbitrary point loads into the battery. Um, so you, you kind of have to, you, you want to sort of feather the load out from the front and rear uh, into the structural battery. Um, it also allows us to uh, use uh, to, to move the the cells uh, closer to the center of the of the car um, because we don't have the the, the, the the in the top one we've got that sort of all the supports and stuff. Mm -hmm. So the, the volumetric efficiency of the structural pack is is much better than a non-structural pack, and we actually bring the, the cells closer to the center um, and. Uh, because they're closer to the center, the, uh, it reduces the probability of uh, of a side impact uh, potentially contacting the cells because they have it has to go in any kind of side impact has to go further in order to reach the cells. Uh, it also proves uh, what's called the polar moment of inertia, uh, which is that you can think of like when there's a like a ice skater uh, arms out or arms in. Arms in, you rotate faster. So if you can r uh, bring things closer to the center, you reduce the polar moment of inertia, and that means you can you, the car maneuvers better. It just feels better. You don't want to know why, but it just it just feels more agile. So it, it's it's really cool. This is really major. Um, like I said, it's a, so 10 percent mass reduction in, in the body of the car, 14 percent range increase, uh, 370 fewer parts. 14 percent so range increase. I mean, I, I really think that, that long term, in any cars that do not uh, take this architecture <coughs> will not be competitive. And it's not just <laughs> at the product level, a better product, um, but in the factory, it's a massive simplification. You saw the part removal, um, you know, it's casting machines, it's the structural battery pack. So we're looking at over 50% reduction in investment per gigawatt hour, 35% reduction in floor space. And we'll continue to improve that as we make the vehicle God in the future. Damn. Yeah, so <laughs> major improvements on, on all fronts. From they just the cell keep innovating and getting better. Um, and in addition to the improvements we just said on enabling additional range and improving the structural performance of the vehicle, it is worth another 7% dollar per kilowatt hour reduction at the battery pack level, bringing our total reductions now to 56% dollar per kilowatt hour. Yeah. Jeez. All right, so stacking it up, we're not just talking about uh, cost or range. We've got to look at all the facets. Range so increase, 54%. Range increase, we're unlocking up to 54% God, increase holy. in range for our vehicles and energy density for our energy products. 56% uh, reduction in dollars per kilowatt hour at the battery pack level and a 69% reduction in investment per gigawatt hour, which is the true enabler when we talk back about how do we achieve this scale problem here. 69% cost uh, reduction. And, yeah, so um, I think it's pretty nice that investment per kilowatt per gigawatt hour reduction is 69%. I mean, who would have thought? Yeah, just hmm. happened to happen <laughs> out that way. Yeah. 69. 
<laughs> Come on. I mean, point four two zero percent, of course. <laughs> um, yeah. So what what, what this uh, enables uh, us to do is achieve a new trajectory in the reduction of of uh, cell cost. And um, now, to be clear, it will take us probably a year to eighteen months to start realizing these uh, these advantages, and probably. To fully realize the advantages, probably it's about three, three years, three or thereabouts. Years. So, um, you know, it, it's it's not like uh, if we could do this instantly, we would. <laughs> um, but it, it's it's really, um, I think, what this bodes for. It, it just really bodes well for the future and means that the long-term scaling of, of Tesla and 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 uh, the sustainable energy products that we make will be uh, massively increased. So, uh, you know, what tends to happen as companies get bigger is things tend to slow down. Um, well, actually, they're going to speed up. And they have to speed up if we're going to accelerate the transition to sustainable energy. Yeah. I mean, long term, we, you know, we want to try to uh, replace about <coughs> you know, uh, at least 1% of the total vehicle fleet on Earth, which is about 2 billion vehicles. So long term, we want to try to make about 20 million vehicles a year. <laughs> 20 million vehicles a year, long term. <laughs> but I think it's important to point <coughs> out that when we talked about three terawatt hours by 2030, the problem is a 20 terawatt hour problem. So everybody needs to be uh, accelerating their efforts to accomplish these objectives. Doesn't matter where you are in the value chain, there is a ton to do. You need to rethink from first principles how you do it so that you can scale to meet all of our objectives. Yep. And Elon? Uh, sure. What does this mean? Uh, what does it mean for, what does this, what does this mean for our future products? <laughs> Uh, so, uh, we, you know, we're, we're confident that long term we can design and, and manufacture a, a, a compelling twenty-five thousand dollar electric vehicle. Um, so, Model Two. Y you know, this this uh, this has always been our dream from the beginning of the company. I even like wrote a blog piece about it um, <laughs> because um, you know our first car was was an expensive sports car, and and then a then it was like slightly less expensive sedan, and then finally sort of a I don't know, mass market premium, but uh, you know, like the Model 3 and Model Y. Um, but it really <coughs> it was always our goal to try to make an affordable electric car. And um, I Compact. think probably, uh, w w yeah, like I said, about, about three years from now, uh, we're confident we can make a very, com uh, uh, very compelling $25,000 electric vehicle uh, that's also fully autonomous. And when you think about the $25,000 price point, you have to consider how much, mo in it, how much less expensive it is to own an electric vehicle. Yeah. So yeah. actually, it it's a, it it's becomes even more affordable at that twenty five thousand dollar price point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have uh, and extreme performance and range, um, and uh, we should probably talk about uh, the you know Model S Plaid. You know, what oh, about <laughs> <laughs> Plaid Model S. Oh my God, three motors, tri motor, I think, right? Top speed two hundred miles. Model S Plaid, baby! Oh, holy! That's 1,100 horsepower. Range, 520 miles. <laughs> yeah. Woo. So, uh, yeah, anyway, we, we, we took the la latest Plaid out to Laguna Seca on Sunday. It got um, a minute 30. Um, and uh, we think probably there's another three seconds or more to take off that time. Uh, so uh, we're confident the Model S Plaid will achieve the, uh, the best track time of any production vehicle ever, of any kind, two-door or otherwise. Oh. <laughs> um, and you can S. order it now. What? Uh, and it's uh, <laughs> available uh, uh, basically end of next year. Okay, so, Plaid. And now we'll move to Q and A. Absolutely. So we we'll invite we'll invite a few people on stage. All right, Jeez. come on up, team. So no compact car. So this is Three just a small portion of the team, but uh, it would be great to you know show you some more of the team and um, and we, when we do Q and A, we can like you know give, give various people different uh, questions to answer. Sounds great. <laughs> Actually, I don't know how we're getting the questions. Oh, yeah. Actually, I don't know either. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know either. You could just, like, 
<laughs> yell them out. Maybe get out of the car for two seconds and, and yell it at us. <laughs> I don't know. Hey, how do we get any concussions? Oh, they're mics. Okay, wait for oh, the mic. Oh, there are mics. <laughs> okay, great, great. <clears throat> All right. <laughs> okay, we'll definitely need to give people mics because otherwise there's no way. Um, sorry? All right, we're going to pass some mics out. Uh, we don't have a name for the $25,000 car yet. It's a great question, though. <laughs> oh, yeah, no name yet. Model 2, I was thinking. Uh, yes, uh, we will be manufacturing uh, cells in, in Berlin. <laughs> yep. Thermal management system? For homes. For homes. Oh, oh, you mean like the home HVAC? Um, yeah, that, I mean, that's a pet project that I'd love to get going on. Um, I don't know, maybe we'll start, start working on that next year. Because um, I just think this, man, you could really make a way better home HVAC system that's really quiet and super efficient and... Uh, yeah, it's super energy efficient and also has like a, you know, a way better filter, uh, you know, for particles and, um, come on, Elon, make uh, it. Yeah. Just, and, and it works, uh, very reliably and, and there, we, we've already developed that for the car. Like, so the, the heat pump, uh, in the model Y, uh, is really pretty spectacular. Uh, I mean, it's tiny, it's efficient. It it's, has to last for 15 years. Uh, it's got to work in all kinds of conditions from, from you know, the coldest winter to the hottest summer. Um, so we've actually already done a massive amount of the work necessary for uh, a, a really kick-ass home HVAC. Um, and they could also like stack them. So if you wanna say, uh, depending upon the size of your house or whatever, how much you need, you can just, you can just basically stack them um, and uh, just have a very compelling, super efficient home HVAC. And then you could also uh, communicate with the car and it'll, it'll know when you're coming home. So it's like, oh, I, I don't need to keep the house cold all day. I just you know, keep, cool it down because I knew you were coming home. Um, so the, the pack can communicate with the car and just like really dial it into when you actually need cooling and heating. It'd be great. Fun product. Yeah. Next year. Who's next? Hello. Hey guys, Eli here uh, from Tesla Owners Club, My Tesla Adventure. Uh, just quick question. So I'm a huge fan of car camping in my Tesla with my dream case, like my all time favorite activity. Is it going to be possible to get climate control to the back of the Cybertruck? Because that would be the ultimate camping machine if we can get all night climate control. Uh, we'll try to do that. <coughs> yeah. I agree. That would be, that'd be really cool. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Who's next? Hello. Yeah. Uh, long time fan. I'm a great guy. Uh, just a question. How does the ice industry look like for uh, in the future? Uh, well, I don't ice think there will industry. be an ice industry long term. <laughs> yeah. Holy crap. I mean, well, I guess there might be like a few things that are like, it's a like curious thing. Like, I mean, I'm pr there's still like some steam engines made somewhere, uh, but like they're just basically sort of quirky collector's items. I mean, that will be the future of the internal combustion engine car. Yeah, collector's items for sure. Hi, Elon, to your left here in the white Model Y. Ryan McCaffrey from the from the Ride the Lightning Tesla Ryan podcast. McCaffrey. I'm curious about Cybertruck. It was interesting to see where you had it in on the battery technology front. I'm sort of curious what you see for it in the production front. Is its volume, you know, trucks are so popular in America. Do you see its volume equaling the three or the Y in the future? And also, is the, uh, did you, did, were you able to get, Tesla is able to legally be sold in Texas as part of the Giga Texas deal. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> Ridiculous. Well, it's hard to say what the volume exactly would be for the Cybertruck. The, the orders are gigantic. So and we have, like, I don't know, well over half a million orders. I, I think maybe six or 600,000. It's a lot, basically. We stopped Holy. counting. Um, 600,000 so orders. I, I think there's probably room for, I don't know, at least, like, a unit volume of, like, 250 to 300,000 a year, maybe more. Um, so uh, now we are designing the Cybertruck to meet the American spec, because if you try to design a, a car to meet the global, the, the, the super set of all global re requirements, it basically, hmm. you can't make the Cybertruck. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it, it really is designed for the American market, but this is the biggest market, or North American market is the biggest market for pickup trucks by far, or l large pickup trucks. And then I think for 
uh, in, we'll probably make an international version of, of the Cybertruck that'll be kind of smaller, you know, kind of like a tight Wolverine package. Um, it'll still be cooler, but it'll be it'll be smaller because you just can't make a giant truck like that for most markets. <laughs> um, so yeah, but it's gonna be great. Uh, <laughs> And I, I'm, I don't know, I think probably we'll be able to sell directly in Texas. Um, we do pretty well right now, uh, but it, it is a bit weird not being able to actually conclude a transaction in Texas, but it, it's got to be like, you know, a click on a server based in California. <laughs> so so um, stupid. But weirdly, we can do leasing in Texas, but not s selling. But I, I, hopefully that'll get cleared up in the future. Uh, Elon, uh, great job with everything that you're doing. Thross Gerber from Gerber Kawasaki. Uh, your team's amazing. What I'm most curious about, these innovations are incredible, but on my drive up here, fully on autopilot for 400 miles, the entire state is brown, and this is ultimately about climate. Has there been some analysis done if all these things are achieved? What will its direct impact be on climate? Uh, well, I mean, hey, the, Chris. I think we'll have a very significant What's impact. What's up? It will Glad that you came the, by. Um, CO2 ppm from growing uh, as it is every year um, and I mean I should say like I'm really excited you know, for this um, this is amazing you know I try to view the, the whole climate thing for you know as a science question as much as possible you know science you always question your hypothesis How are you? is it true is it not true or assign a probability to a given hypothesis and I should say that my my original interest in electric vehicles uh, predates the climate issue um, like just when I was in high school, it was like I thought, man, if if we don't figure out electric cars, the whole economy is going to collapse when we run out of oil. So it's like we better figure out electric cars uh, and sustainable energy, or civilization is going to crumble. Um, and then uh, it was only kind of later that the uh, significance of the the climate risk uh, became apparent. Um, and uh, we we're also able, uh, using fracking and other types of technology, to access a lot more uh, fossil fuels than previously thought, um, which is, you know, uh, helpful for lowering the cost of gasoline, but it's pretty bad for uh, the total uh, tonnage of CO2 that you could put in the atmosphere. It's now greatly beyond what pe people previously thought. So, um, but, but this is, you know, as we were just going through in this presentation, it's like it is a absolutely monumental task to accelerate uh, the advent of sustainable energy. Uh, I mean, the entire global economy is still, you know, n more than 99% dependent on, or r quote, roughly 99% dependent on fossil fuels. Um, so although electric cars kind of get a lot of press right now, they, they, they're still, and, and, and there's still very few, as a percentage of the total global fleet is practically nothing. It's, I would say, yes, less than 1% of the global fleet is electric. Right now. Wow, less than one um, percent. Yeah, because of two two billion cars and trucks and whatnot in use. So it doesn't so seem massive, that way, but uh, yeah, it's amount true. of work ahead, just in, just insane, like hard to comprehend how much work is ahead to uh, at get the new vehicle production to be sustainable, uh, to um, massively increase the amount of stationary storage, which is critical because uh, renewable Power energy walls. is is intermittent. Uh, wind and solar is. It's intermittent. Sometimes the wind doesn't blow, and, some, and this obviously sun doesn't shine at night. So you, you've got to have batteries, um, a massive, massive number of batteries. So it's yeah, it's hard to measure in direct impact, but it's it's an experiment that we shouldn't be performing. And the sooner we can sort yeah. of end the experiment, the sooner we can kind of move on in a fully sustainable way that is actually lower cost. I mean, I think the thing that people yeah. haven't fully internalized. Is It'll once we do get to the 25k car, cheaper. the ownership cost of that car is incredibly lower than the prior car. And then on the solar side and wind, with the cost of solar and wind coming down, and with batteries coming down w with them, the actual cost of energy on the grid is going down. So we're we're sort of moving to a towards a sustainable lower cost future. So it, it, there's not really like a sacrifice. Yeah, that's true. It, it is a false dichotomy to say that it's like it's either prosperity or sustainability. <laughs> uh, this is often used you know, buy oil and gas to say like, oh, well, do you want people to lose their jobs? Do you want to have, do you want lower people standards, standards of living? Do you want to, you know, make all these economic sacrifices uh, really in, in order to have sustainability? And the reality, as Drew was saying, uh, is that uh, a sustainable energy is going to be lower cost, not higher cost than uh, fossil fuels. Um, thank Elon, you quick question for you, um, right here in front. First, uh, thanks Where? for having everyone, and is telling a friend 
the one company to go oh. there for that's going to have the biggest structural impact over the next 10 years at scale, it's probably Tesla. So kudos to everyone at Tesla for what they've done to this point and, and going forward. Um, the two questions for you, as you've looked at the auto and the storage markets, I know you've talked about it at kind of 50-50 long term, but it seems like a lot of the battery cost curve achievements that you're see that you presented today really make some of these storage uh, opportunities much more feasible over the next five years. And so I guess the first part of the question is, does your calculus upon learning and improving these things change on that 50-50 mix, or is there a role where storage becomes bigger? And then the second part of the question with, with all these huge grand visions, who's going to be with Tesla from a corporate perspective accomplishing these things? Obviously, Tesla can't do it alone. But when you look at some of the traditional auto industry or power, et cetera, I don't see a lot of other Teslas. <laughs> um, well, actually, th so there's a lot of companies in China that I think are doing great work uh, with electric vehicles and uh, also with stationary storage. Um, although we don't see that much I in the U.S. yet, but I think probably we will in the future. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, obviously, we're doing everything ca we can to encourage uh, other companies to move to uh, sustainable transport um, and also, you know, m make stationary storage batteries. Um, you know, we opened up, o uh, made our patents freely available. Um, uh, you know, we really try to tell these companies, hey, you really need to do this or you won't exist in the future. <laughs> uh, but they don't believe it, you know. So, I mean, we've, tr we've talked until we're blue in the face. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what, what are we supposed to do? Um, um, but we really are hopeful that other companies will also uh, do what we're doing and that will make the a sustainable future come sooner. From um, a fundamental market size perspective, like we, we did the first like ground up work to show the size of the of the market in terawatt hours and they are roughly 50, 50, 10 terawatt hours for transportation, 10 terawatt hours for the grid. Um, and part of that is because yeah. the grid batteries, because when you're making a power plant, you're making a, a large investment um, our 25-year assets are greater. Um, you know, if, if they were, if the grid batteries were 10-year kind of things, the grid market would be bigger. But because it's a longer duration asset, they're roughly the same size. Thinking long term, um, is there any other segments that this new battery will be able to disrupt or electrify? Is that galley? Um, beyond just the initial Model 2 or cheaper sedan, like a boat, boring company loop, plane, boat. Where are you, Gally? Oh, are you there? there? Gally, yeah. Right I've been changed. Okay, great. <laughs> right, yeah, it's, like, it's like ventriloquism here. You know? it's like, <laughs> uh, we just get the sound out of the speaker and you can't tell where the heck it's coming from. <laughs> Yeah, a any hints, or is the Model 2 such a big deal because it decreases the cost of transportation that that is really the disruption? Or should we get hyped that this new cost curve opens up different vehicle categories like a high passenger density bus, boring loop, boat, plane? Um, well, Who wants hints? Uh, I mean, there's Hi, there, there are Tesla plane in limited production right now that do exceed 400 uh, watt hours per kilogram, which I think is about the number you need for a uh, decent range medium range uh, aircraft. Um, and uh, I think our batteries will, over time, start to approach the 400 watt hours per kilogram range as well. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, I think over time, we'll see all modes of transport, uh, with the ironic exception of rockets, mm -hmm. uh, transition to sustainability, um, or to, to electric, basically. Um, on, the, on the rocket front, uh, what we're planning to do is uh, like about 80% of Starship is oxy is uh, liquid oxygen, um, and uh, we're actually already uh, run running a power line to be able to use wind power to create the liquid oxygen. So uh, we're making you know some decent progress on uh, s sustainability on the rocket front, but there's just no way to have an electric rocket, um, and it's important for the future of uh, life and consciousness that we become a multi-planet species. So uh, got to keep doing that. Hi, Elon. Hello. Josh Phillips here, retail investor. I have a question in regards to the lithium and nickel industries and the likely price spikes and shortages of high-grade materials. The EV industry is likely to see, if they don't act fast, to address future supply. 
Tesla have clearly made the right moves that are necessary, but there's a real worry that the potential supply issues and price spikes will create a drag on the rest of the EV in industry and therefore a drag on global EV adoption. What advice would you give to the EV and mining industries to quickly solve this looming hurdles? Because for a sustainable energy future, the spice must flow. Thank you. <laughs> Dune. Yeah. yeah, indeed. Spice must flow. <laughs> he got that one. Spice. Um, I don't know. I think the... Dune spice. You know, the, the, I, it's, I'm not sure. I, I guess what we, we can try to like basically uh, overdo it in cell production and perhaps supply cells to others. Um, but uh, we do see the fundamental, con fundamental constraint as total cell production. That's why we're putting so much effort into making cells um, and kind of reinventing, uh, trying to reinvent every aspect of cell production fr from uh, mining the ore to a, a complete battery pack. Um, because it's the fundamental constraint. It's, it's no, we're not getting into the cell business because we, uh, you know, just for the hell of it, it's because it's the fundamental constraint. It's the thing that is uh, the limiting factor for uh, rapid growth. Um, but uh, we, we could certainly try to overdo it on cell, cell production and perhaps uh, sell cells to others. Um, although we are going at absolute top speed, so it's like, yeah. it's they're not they're like we're holding it back. Um, but I, I think like uh, just making really efficient cars and uh, you know that are, have low drag coefficient, um, low re loading resist, low uh, rolling resistance, uh, efficient powertrains. Um, I mean that's kind of what we've done in order to make uh, iron phosphate uh, still have a, a, a good range. Um, so the iron phosphate phosphate is low, lower energy density a solution, but um, there's um, you know wh while there are some limitations on the total amount of nickel produced every year there's really no limit on the iron there's so much iron it's ridiculous so you can really scale up uh iron phosphate um you know f at a raw materials basis faster more than you can nickel uh, but yeah and just just to point out you know when we were walking through this presentation we intentionally separated all the different aspects the benefits of structural battery apply to a iron-based cathode in the same way they apply to a nickel-based chemistry cathode yeah. You get longer range uh, uh, iron based vehicles, and also the silicon benefit can apply to the iron based vehicles as well. So, there's we can do a lot to extend the range of an iron based vehicle, which is why it's a key part of the roadmap going forward. And then, I invert invited Turner up here to talk sure. about what the mining uh, industry can do. Yeah, um, diversification on the cathode side is obviously massive, and EVs are all about efficiency. And so, for the EV industry, for the vehicle industry, we need to see powertrain efficiency really increase at all other companies matching Tesla powertrain efficiency so that everyone can have that diversified cathode approach where LFP is used in medium range and, and even really make a 300 mile vehicle with LFP. Um, and really the goal that we were trying to present here was a model for vertical integration, strategic vertical integration that a lot of different people can do. What, what, what we need to see <coughs> is Vertical integration that shortens the fu the process path from mine to cathode, and you know what we're doing here is 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 novel, and we're we're trying to push the industry in that direction. So you know we're we're presenting a model here that that anyone can can follow. Cool, awesome, yeah, good if job. In fact, is there, if there's anything that that you guys want to comment on, uh, feel free to step forward and say something. I I think the key is to be smart about your chemistry choices, yeah, your materials you choices. Talk louder. Yeah, th if you're smart about your materials choices, um, the spice will continue to flow. Yeah. <laughs> you, don't, you don't need to use the same kind everywhere. And if you, it, it's about strategically planning it out. And, and for miners, I think we are incentivizing them quite a bit to ramp up their production. Yeah. yeah. And actually, we had good calls. Like, they're all motivated. I think, I think that they, they've been sort of sitting back being like, are you going to grow like crazy? And we're like, yeah, we're yeah, going to grow like crazy. And grow like crazy. I think this <laughs> indicates we're going to grow like crazy. And that's what the miners want to hear. And then they'll go make the investments. Hello, Elon. Uh, this is Ben Limpic. I'm a musician. I was wondering, <laughs> does Tesla have any um, future plans to make partnerships with music companies like it has done with Tencent Games or things like that for you guys to actually kind of expand your services um, for artists and other types of creative people to get involved in 
you know, producing content that can be part of the Tesla ecosystem or so other people that do creative things can get involved with you guys? Wow, that's cool. Good um, question. Well, we don't, uh, we haven't really thought about that much, but it, I suppose it's probably something we should think about. Um, we will be providing a uh, title uh, <laughs> on uh, Tesla's. Um, so, you know, we're providing, you know, music, more music sources uh, that people can choose from. And uh, just try yeah, to, the try to is the awesome. entertainment experience in the cars. You're right, Chris. Um, and I think actually, as, as we go to a more autonomous future, uh, the, the importance of entertainment um, and productivity will become greater and greater. Um, I mean, to the degree that if, I mean, if you're just basically sitting in your car, the car is fully autonomous and driving yeah, somewhere. It's sort of like being Yeah, they could a, just recycle a, them you know, the car and just keep using car. the recycled and, materials. And, and then uh, the things that become they won't need to mine are, anymore. Okay, well, it's amazing. Uh, let's have good entertainment. And uh, you know, if you want to do some productivity stuff, then that, that actually starts to become much more important because you're no Mind longer blown, spending your yeah. attention driving the car. <laughs> so it will be extremely important in the future. Should we do some of the say.com questions? OK. Should we do the second one? Uh, yeah, uh, the first one I think we already answered. Like, if we're if we have um, if we're able to make enough sales, we w which we'll try to do, or we, we will supply other companies. Uh, it's definitely not an intentional effort to keep the, the sales to ourselves. Uh, if we can make enough for other companies, we'll we will supply them. And we're trying to do you know the right thing for ad advancing the s sustainable energy, whatever that 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 is. So. Vehicle to grid. We get asked that a lot. Vehicle to grid. They didn't announce that. Oh, yeah. I think one thing that's important to note is the... The million mile battery. They didn't grid, announce uh, that either. It, it doesn't... In, unless you have a power cutoff, like you, you need to cut off your main supply to the grid. Otherwise, if, you're, if you lose power in your house, you'll basically just b backflow uh, energy to the grid. So just having a, a reversal in the, in the power flow does this not hurts actually the stock price short uh, term. keep the lights on. Um, you, you need a whole separate system to it, cut off power to the grid. It probably won't move um, the stock. I think it's also the case Let that right people now. really want the freedom there to be able to drive anything and that to, big. Uh, charge yeah, see, it's house. gone way down. And so it, yeah, it does. <laughs> if, uh, it does. You know, you get to morning and your car uh, instead of being charged, it it discharged. Uh, into but you the can house you can adjust that. You you you're sort of okay now. I can either drive or use the battery to power my house. Uh, I think it's actually going to be better for people's freedom of action to have a power wall um, and a car separate, um, and then you, then it's uh, you know everything works. The, the the you know and you add that you basically combine that with solar either, either solar retrofit or solar glass solar glass roof um, and a local battery storage. So you basically become your own utility, um, and then the, the the car is uh, you know can be charged also with solar. Um, I, I think that's like the stuff that works. Uh, you know, that said, uh, like we can certainly do vehicle to grid. Um, and I think we can, uh, like we can basically enable that with software in Europe or something, right? Uh, yeah. <coughs> um, we are future generations of power electronics. We will be able to do this more or less everywhere from a like energy market participation perspective. But, but yeah, from a backing up the house, and it just so happens that the way the North American connectors are on all the cars in North America, it doesn't matter whether it's the Tesla connector or the, the connector that the other vehicles have, doesn't actually support powering your home. It's uh, unfortunate, so you'd need a, a, an additional hardware to do that. Um, but, but, but yeah, in the future, all, all versions of our vehicles will be able to at least do bidirectional power flow for the purposes of energy market par participation. But even for that, it's important to remember that your car isn't plugged in 24 seven. So it's kind of an unpredictable uh, resource for the grid. It'll have a value, but it's not the same as a stationary battery pack. Yeah, on, honestly, a vehicle to grid uh, sounds good, but I think actually has a much lower utility than people think. Um, I, I think very, very few people would actually use vehicle to grid. And we, we I want to buy more. Yeah, Buster, well, the we stock had, price uh, right now to dropped to aftermarket. It's at 406. So um, it's gone way down. <laughs> It was at 424, and now it's at. How do we find the engineers to do 400? So, how do we find the engineers dip. to do all these things? Uh, well, uh, I, I guess we recruit. Uh, we're. I'm recruit gonna keep a lot buying more. From, from all In five years, ten years, um, these prices are gonna look you know, so I think cheap. Tesla has a good reputation for doing exciting engineering. 
um, and that tends to attract the, a lot of the top engineers in the world because uh, they know that their efforts at Tesla will um, really uh, serve the greater good um, and, and we're super hardcore about engineering. Um, you know, Tesla is like, first of all, Me too, Chris. an engineering company. It's like hardcore engineering is what we do. Um, like the, the sheer amount of hardcore engineering done at Tesla is insane. Um, and if hardcore you look at, uh, engineering. Say, uh, there's various surveys done of engineering schools. Uh, where do you want to go? Um, like, what's your top choices? And actually, the top two choices SpaceX um, and Tesla. Last, you know, last few years have been uh, Tesla and SpaceX. So sometimes it's Tesla first, and sometimes SpaceX first. But those are the two top ones. Yeah, I mean, if you are motivated to solve some of these problems, which are the hardest problems in the world to solve, that really fundamentally enable the future we all need, uh, please reach out. Yeah, and help and us uh, work on these problems. Absolutely, and like, like we said, the battle is far from over. Um, you know, l less than one percent of the global automotive fleet has been converted to electric, um, and uh, and even t maybe point one, less than point one percent of stationary storage has been done. So stationary stor storage storage has barely one. begun. Uh, converting the global vehicle fleet to electric has barely begun. Um, so there's still a massive amount of engineering work to be done at Tesla and, and other companies to uh, accelerate this transition to sustainability. That's it. Hey, can you guys hear me? Well, yeah. Uh, this is Jordan from Mark Asset Management. Um, so you've talked about the importance of the factory, and you've mentioned the ground-up design process and a lot of the new things that you're going to be doing or started to do in Shanghai, Berlin, and Austin. Can you just maybe help us understand and, and quantify like how – financially meaningful all of those improvements will be and then given what you're trying to accomplish as a company is it fair to assume that the vast majority of improvement will be given back to the customer in the form of lower prices hmm um yeah i mean it's it, i think certainly uh we will uh try to give back as much as possible to the customers it's not like you know it's not like Tesla's profitability is crazy high. Uh, you know, our, our average profitability for the last four quarters is like maybe 1%. So uh, just to be clear, it's not like you know, we're minting money. Uh, yeah. Our valuation makes it seem like we are, but we're not. Um, so uh, we, we, we do want to try to make the price as, as competitive as we can without, like, losing money. And if you lose money, then, you, you know, you keep doing, if you keep losing money, you'll just die. So yeah. we have to uh, – this thing called profit is just like we need to bring in more money than we spend. Otherwise, we're dead. <laughs> So, <laughs> but affordability is key to how we scale, yeah. right? Like the demand goes nonlinear as you reduce the, the price of the car. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's important to, to sort of separate the, the difference between affordability and value for money uh, or desirability of the product. So, uh, you know, for a lot of people, they want to buy a Tesla. They simply don't have enough money. Um, we could make the car infinitely desirable, but if somebody does not have enough money, they can't buy it. Um, uh, sometimes, you know, uh, if people, you know, Kind of forget this. It's like, it's it's not. It's like somebody ha people have to have enough money to buy the car, um, and and just making a car super desirable but expensive does not m mean they can afford it. So it's absolutely important that critical that we make cars that people can that people can actually afford. Yeah. Um, so I think that's uh, over here. Some more. Things, uh, just scroll down or something. <laughs> oh. Uh, when do you expect Tesla vehicles to beat ICE vehicles on initial purchase price? I think a way to answer that question is, in the classes of vehicles we sell today, we're already doing that. Yeah, we're already pretty, yeah, pretty yeah. close. Yeah, pretty um, close. And then, and then maintenance costs. factoring cost. in total cost of ownership. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the fact that electric vehicles, re vehicles require much less servicing um, and are way cheaper to run. Uh, when you when you look at like to you know total cost of ownership, and you can obviously lease a car, so. If you just like lease a car or or get a loan for a car, you've got your sort of monthly payment, and then your cost for uh, either gasoline or electricity, um, and your cost of servicing, and the the fully considered cost of an electric car is uh, much less than uh, a, a gasoline car of the same nominal purchase price. Um, you know, uh, I mean that said, and like may, maybe on the order of th you know three years w uh, when we can do. Um, a lower cost, car, like a twenty-five thousand dollar car. Um, you know, I think that will be basically on par, maybe slightly better than a comparable gasoline car. So I think maybe it's it's on the order of three years, ish. <laughs> How 
How have the technology advancements and increased vertical integration of battery manufacturing influenced your ability to improve the environmental and social impact of the supply chain? And I think, yeah. yeah I think we sort of have said that already. Yeah. yeah. Do we have some ability to scroll through this? <laughs> I just scroll away. Have we covered recycling? Yeah. Well, sc just sc scroll until we've got stuff that we, we haven't covered. Best of batteries. Well, we definitely covered that top yeah, one. Yeah, a lot of these things, <laughs> things we've already answered, I think. Covered that. Best of time to outsource that battery one. packs. We said that already. I think we, I think we literally already. just answered yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I saw That's a cathode okay. durability question. Let's go to that one. Go down, go down, go down. Good technical question. Keep going. How are you going to address the cathode durability and cost environmental impact trifecta? Is this something you're going to leave the upstream supply chain to solve? No, I think we tried to answer that directly. I mean, we really are looking at not just what happens in the cathode facility, but like currently outside the cathode facility that should really be inside and removing processes that shouldn't have been there in the first place and uh, the use of reagents that- Okay, guys. I got to go, but you guys can continue watching. Thank you guys for joining me guys, today. Is there anything you, you want to add to? I think it's over pretty much, like, uh, but thank you, Chris. Thank you, everyone who joined me today. Maybe really appreciate it. This was awesome. You know, um, the stock is way down, so um, sure. if you guys want to um, buy, <laughs> it's 403. I just want to the fact that this is a massive problem. Massive but, problem. Um, and <laughs> it seems like Tesla's on its way and ahead. Um, thank you guys for joining me. Help. I'll see you guys um, next time. It's everybody's plan. I'm out of here. And Peace. we're not going to get to 20 terawatt by ourselves. So yeah. please think about this carefully.